Hello and welcome to our podcast on joy of teaching international student. I'm Dr. Nazrin Sultana, a teaching and learning consultant at Conestoga College, and I'm the host of the podcast. In this podcast, we share our teaching journey and wisdom about teaching international students in the college classrooms. Today, my guest is Jennifer Shamla, a full-time faculty at the college. Jennifer will share her joy and learning from teaching international students. I'm excited to host this conversation. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Nazreen. Great to be here. Thanks for joining. Would you like to share something about your background? Sure. So I um, am a registered dietitian and actually grew up in Manitoba, went to the University of Manitoba and worked as a clinical dietitian for a number of years and decided that my passion was in public health nutrition. So I moved a little bit further east to Thunder Bay, Ontario, and worked in public health for a number of years before moving a little bit further east in southern Ontario, where I continued my practice as a registered dietitian in many different fields, including corrections, um, private practice, in the retail sector, And started to begin dabbling a little bit in teaching. I had been invited to be a guest lecturer at a couple of different post-secondary colleges and universities. And that is when I think my real passion um, started shining. And I decided that I really wanted to focus on exploring opportunities to teach. Such a rich background. I was just thinking that exactly when you decided to be a full-time teacher. Well, at the time, so this was going back probably about 10 years ago, in some of my roles, I had experiences where I would provide nutrition education in group settings. And I think that really began to spark my interest in teaching. And I remember at one point when I was in Thunder Bay and I was asked to go to Confederation College to provide a guest lecture in nutrition. And I was in a room with a variety of different students in different programs, including uh, dental hygiene, I believe uh, physio assistant programs. And I just kind of had this spark in terms of, wow, I can really see myself in this setting, in a post-secondary setting. Um, teaching others about nutrition and nutrition kind of being, I guess, the subject area that I'm passionate about and wanting to really be in that classroom. And really that experience, I think, was what drove the next few years in my career. So I tried to get additional experience doing guest lectures. Um, Once I moved to Southern Ontario, I was fortunate in that part of my dietitian network. Um, I had a couple of of former colleagues working in post-secondary institutions where I was invited again to guest lecture. I pursued a, a certificate in adult education. So I became a student myself about 20 21 years after I I graduated from university and um, took some different courses in adult education um, and learning about different strategies to teach adult learners. And um, at that point, I had been offered to teach one course in the culinary program at the Waterloo campus for Conestoga College. It was the most exciting time because I actually had my own course. Um, So I was a part-time instructor. I had my own course to teach. I had a very small class and I loved it. Um, In fact, um, so much that I, you know, started reaching out uh, more to, again, to different colleagues and and different post-secondary environments. And fortunately, I was able to secure a part-time position in the nutrition and food service management program at Conestoga Dune campus. Uh, The nutrition and food service management program was new. So it started in 2017 and I was contracted to teach one course the first year. 
it started. And then I taught another course in the second semester and became full-time sessional. Um, it was a big step for me because I left a permanent full-time position uh, to actually take on a contract position sessional with the college in the nutrition and food service management program. Best decision I ever made. Um, that position ended up turning into a permanent faculty position. And I guess it's been six years now that I've been full time. And, you know, there's been a lot of challenges over the years and I'm coordinating the program now, too, <laughs> which is a, another big learning curve for me. But um, by far has been the most rewarding experience in my career. Absolutely. Thank you, Jennifer, for sharing this. And I'm happy that you joined teaching. I can see the passion when you speak about teaching. Uh, so do you have lots of international students in your program? We do. Um, I would say right from year one, we've welcomed a number of international students into the program. And I can say that when I started, it was definitely a new experience for me. And uh, now I'm interested and curious. So do you remember any story that first time you started teaching international students and was there any surprises, something which was an aha moment for you? I'm just looking for a story. Yeah. So, I mean, there was probably a lot of aha moments, um, but I do something that is is still really quite vivid in my memory from the early years and I remember, you know, welcoming, you know, it's week one, right, of the semester. And it's, you know, one of the most exciting weeks for me because I get to welcome all of the students into the program. And of course, our cohort is diverse, number of international students, some domestic students. And um, as I'm welcoming them and as I'm carrying on uh, my, you know, week one plan, you know, I have my lesson plan and I'm following this lesson plan and I'm asking, you know, anyone have questions, you know, and a short time later, anyone has anyone have questions and there were never any questions. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, this is, you know, this is interesting, like you know, am I doing such a great job of explaining, you know, what this course is about and the evaluations and our learning platform and um, all of the things that students need to know how to do and find and, and no one has any questions. And I thought, oh, you know, maybe, you know, maybe they're just, um, you know, a little bit shy to share, you know, it is, you know, the, you know, week one, um, but I would, you know, kind of carry on. And I thought, you know, what, what, what's going on here? Because, you know, not not to have kind of any types of questions is is kind of unusual, I'm thinking. Right. And and I'm talking to some of my colleagues in um, in the program, some of our other part time faculty. And I'm you know asking them, oh, with, you know, is your quiet, you know, your class really quiet? And did you do any types of icebreakers? And I'm chatting with other coordinators and other programs and um uh, and I will say teaching and learning uh, was a and they still are an absolute, you know, fabulous resource for us, because I remember attending some workshops um, during that first semester teaching and learning a little bit about how um, common it is in different countries around the world to be in an environment where as a student, you're there to learn. You're not there to talk. You're not yeah. there to participate, right? You're not there to ask questions. Um, you're simply, you know, there to listen, uh, listen to the lecture. And I thought about that a little bit and thought, you know, did I really create an environment where students felt comfortable, where they you know, learn that it's welcome to ask questions and, you know, we expect questions among our stu students. Um, so I remember that being a really aha moment going, OK, what do I need to do differently or what what can I do to set my students up so that they are in a position of knowing that in our classroom, um, you know, we welcome discussions and we welcome comments and we welcome students sharing their experience and asking questions because that's really only making that environment that we're in our learning environment so much richer 
um, as well as, you know, really being able to help the students with some of their challenges that they're having, especially in those early early weeks yes. when, you know, there is just so much going on and so much that uh, students need to process. And there is stress too. Lots of anxiety is there. They just have arrived in a new country. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And Nazreen, you know, I look back now and I'm honestly like a little bit embarrassed sometimes at how kind of naive I was or how there were so many assumptions that I made about what our students would be uh, coming with to the classroom, right? Yeah. Like, like things that I never thought about, like a pen and paper, right? I thought, well, who wouldn't come to a classroom with a pen and paper, right? Or, um, yeah, not understanding, like, you know, everything is totally new, mm. you know? And now, you know, I chat with some of our international students in the first week and I, I one of my first questions is, how is how is it coming to campus today? What was that experience like, right? Navigating the bus or you know like figuring out you know it's the, you know just how to get here because some of our students literally arrive the day before classes start. Yeah, 100%. Or, yeah, or during the first week, right? Where they're literally just thrown in. Um and when we think about how knew it would be even for someone who is living, mm -hmm. um, you know, close, you know, close by living in Kitchener, Waterloo, living in Ontario, whatever, how, you know, new everything is for them, but coming to a new country where absolutely everything is new, um, it takes some time, right? And it takes um, support. And I do feel really fortunate that we have so many resources through our campus, um, like through Conestoga. And one of the first sessions I remember as a, as a new faculty that was really helpful was simply learning about the support services on campus. Oh yes. hundred percent. They don't right? know about this. No. And, and then of course, and, and my role now is ensuring, you know, our part-time faculty, you know, are aware and, um, you know, are, are also able to tap into some of those resources, but, you know, um, our, our student success advisors, for example, we have an advisor that's attached to our program as all programs do, um, but being able to link our students to those advisors. So if a student is having um, some stress, right, related mm -hmm. to um, housing, related to uh, finances or food or loneliness. Mm -hmm. I mean, just last week, I spoke to a student who is in her second semester and it was her birthday. And she was, you know, just beaming um, because uh, her and her friends in the program were all going to go out for dinner. It was a Friday evening. They were going out to dinner and how excited she was. And I asked if she was going to be uh, speaking with her family and she, oh, yes, you know, going to be speaking with the family. And she said, "I, you know what I really miss, Jennifer, is, is I miss my dad and I miss my dad um, wishing me a happy birthday um, kissing me on my forehead and telling me that I, that he loves me. And, you know, it's those, you know, those little times that the students share what they miss about being at home. And a lot of it is around their family and their friends. And while they video call, yes. um, you know, and we see them too in the halls and, if a classroom is empty, you can see them on a video call and you know, it's, you know, they're on a call with their family. Um, and with time differences, sometimes I'll come into the class. I'm usually, you know, early for an 8 a.m. class. I'll come in at 7.30 a.m. and I'll see a few of my students already sitting there and I'll see them on a video call. Um, and I know that's a great time for them to reach their family. And sometimes they'll turn their phone around the goal. Look, you know, mom, this is, <laughs> this is Jennifer. This is, you know, one of my professors. And, um, it's, you know, I'm, I'm happy that we have the technology that we do now that, you know, you can do the video calls, but the loneliness and the homesickness is real. Mm -hmm. um, and I hear that quite often. Um, so being able, you know, to, you know, be there for my students, to be able to ensure that they're supported with their peers. Um, and in our program, we emphasize 
the community building, like we do feel our program is our own little community. Um, and early on, we really put a lot of effort into um, togetherness, learning from each other, getting to know each other. Um, so as I was talking earlier about week one and how overwhelming it can be for students and how sometimes as faculty, we like to just jump right into our course. We don't anymore, right? We, we sit back, we relax, we get to know each other. We talk about what it was like getting to campus. We talk about, you know, where we're coming from. Um, we talk about our favorite foods, right? And, yeah. um, you know, being in a program that, you know, you know, we, we obviously talk a lot about food, but we do a lot of that sharing early on. And it's awesome when you start seeing friendships mm. being developed. Yeah. Um, you know, that's you know, obviously really rewarding to you being part of being part of that. Thank you, Jennifer. You probably can see that my eyes are watered because as you're talking, I was almost relieving my experience many years back when I was a new student. The loneliness is real. It's a real big deal. And it impacts mental health, every every other thing you're doing in your college life, definitely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we have so many new part-time faculty, new people who are joining to teaching, people who are excited and passionate, but then may not know some of those techniques to involve students. Uh, as somebody who is passionate about teaching and have been teaching for a while, what is one tip you'd like to share with the new faculty that do this and probably you will get better uh, effective classroom teaching in your class? I think one of the main areas that I would provide a little advice in would be the area around assessments and evaluations and uh, more specifically around written assignments. Number one is we sometimes expect that students would be able to read some instructions and be ready set on their way to delivering a assignment that meets your expectations. And number one, many students are not familiar with rubrics. Yes. And I remember attending a teaching and learning workshop, actually, when um, there was talk about rubrics and actually rubrics weren't around. I'm dating myself a little bit, but rubrics weren't around when, when I was in school. Mm -hmm. But when I went to do my certificate in adult ed, um, we had rubrics. And I thought, how awesome is this? It's like a checklist you can use to, you know, make sure uh, all your components of your assignment are there and whatever uh, is being evaluated is included in the rubric. And so number one now, we make um, it a priority to ensure all of our faculty are reviewing rubrics. Okay. And the structure of them, like what they mean, how to use them, um, how to read them. Um, we try to align our rubrics in a way that um, is kind of part of best practices in terms of what we want to include in it and how to word it. Um, so the rubrics is a big one, but also breaking down assignments. So while we might have instructions, it's helpful to also have, for example, a video walking through the specific elements of an assignment or different steps. I usually do you know, steps to creating an assignment, uh, working through those, not only in class, but also through a video so that students can go back to that video that's posted on Econestoga and see me walking through um, how to do the assignment. Also, I've learned that it can be helpful to emphasize or um, check in on the process. So not always just the end result of that assignment that that's come to you in your Dropbox on Econestoga, but what has a, you know, what a student has taken in terms of the process of building an assignment and having check-in points yes. I have learned is extremely valuable to make sure students are on the right track. Um, sometimes we might do those in small groups, right? Where mm -hmm. we might have uh, small groups actually critiquing or, um, you know, kind of uh, assessing where everyone is sort of at in an assignment and sharing ideas and using the rubric to kind of evaluate drafts and providing some suggestions to each other, for example. Um, or I might have a Zoom drop-in um, or an on-campus drop-in. 
after class where students are just welcome to come in um, and bring their questions about their assignment or, um, you know, to review a particular element of an assignment. So really looking at those evaluations and how we can set students up for success. Yes. And writing services. One other tip with assignments is um, the supportive writing services has been very valuable for our students. You can make group appointments, individual appointments. Um, so if you have a student that might be a bit reluctant to you know, go and make an appointment and see someone from writing services one on one. You can go, you know, in a small group or with a partner uh, to get some help, uh, which is also, you know, really, really helpful for students. And they can be booked online also. They don't they don't yeah. have to go to anybody. They can book it exactly. online and can just go for the drop in or maybe meet on Zoom. So writing right. services are awesome for the students. And many students coming from out of Canada, they do not know this on-campus support that you have been talking about. So definitely. And Jennifer, thank you for talking about assessment. Uh, the way we do assessments uh, in the North American classrooms are very different than the way it has been done, even in my home country also. So the writing long assignment may not be a thing for many of the students. So thank you for right. sharing that. And I really love the idea of checking. That is really impactful and helpful for the students. Yeah, it has been helpful. And we also try to have example assignments as well available for students to look at. You mean sample? Yeah, exactly. Have some samples available too. Um, that's been also something that's been quite effective too to help the students. Especially yeah. for level one, right? Because uh, it's oh. helpful for them. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. One one other area that we've been really working towards in, in our program, because it is a two year program, is establishing a um, we call it a mentor kind of mentor program. It um, it's kind of still in development, even though we have started it where we have linked a second year student. Um, or I should say students to a, a small group of first year students. Oh, is voluntary for them, right? Yeah. Well, we've integrated in, into the curriculum, actually, okay. where our level two students and one of their courses need to plan a meeting. Um, and so we've used it as a kind of a stepping stone to create what we call this mentor event, where our second years uh, plan kind of a, we call it a mini it's kind of a mini meeting. It's very informal, but where they meet a small group of first years on campus um, and they, um, you know, they might show them around, give them some tips in terms of what they, you know, found was challenging or any advice for them that they learned in their first semester. And feedback has been absolutely outstanding from our first years in terms of how awesome it was for their um, senior students to be giving them tips because they know that they were in their shoes a year ago. Okay. Uh, and so we're building, uh, kind of building on that a little bit more, but having kind of, um, uh, 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 area or or a plan, I guess, where those second years can kind of mentor the first years. And of course, our second years love it because they're, you know, feeling like they're able to support and help someone else, which is also, you know, a really good uh, feeling when we're helping others. Definitely. Yeah. And it sounds beautiful. Uh, we are almost at the end of our conversation as you wrap up and thank you for sharing all those wonderful stories, supports and tips with us. Any word of wisdom or any any story you'd like to share that which really made your teaching impactful? Um, anything you'd like to share as a wrap up for the other people who are listening to you right now? Yeah, I think... The most rewarding, I mean, there's been so many rewarding periods over the course of the last six years I've been teaching in the program. But I think one of the most wonderful times always is around our graduation time when convocation rolls around and we usually have a program potluck celebration where students bring in dishes and we celebrate. And the different comments and the different um, things that they share 
um, being like, you know, Jennifer, this has been the, the best experience of my life. Or sometimes family members come, um, travel for convocation and our international students are so proud and their family members are so proud and they come to us with just these big smiles and how mm -hmm. awesome their time in our college and our program has been. And that is the most uh, the feeling you can't really describe, but it it is always the time of the year that I look forward to the most is seeing them succeed and just being so extremely proud of them because it wasn't easy for them. Right. There were challenges, but with support, with perseverance, um, they were able to succeed. And it's just absolutely amazing to be part of that journey uh, with them. Thank you, Jennifer. And you will make me again cry. Yeah, everything you are saying is uh, they are reminding me of my journey as a, as a student in Canada. Uh, thank you so much for sharing the stories, the tips and techniques. And uh, I'm going to wrap up our session here today. And I hope that you continue sharing your joys about teaching international students with students and with faculty. And thank you so much for joining this session. Oh, my pleasure, Nazreen. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs>